My ancient brother was in school with me, just so you know. It's, it's great to be back. This is like coming home for us and uh, to see all the graduates. I saw a number of them this week where I was preaching in Indiana. And everywhere I go, I meet young men and women who were trained here, like my wife and I were, and they are continuing. And uh, I'm just thrilled to see all of you here today. I'm going to give just a, a brief thought and get out of the way. Brother Michael's going to preach to us here in just a moment. But I do want to try to encourage your faith by introducing you to a young man in the New Testament that I don't think gets much attention, but he's mentioned twice. I want you to open your Bible with me, if you will, very quickly, to the book of Colossians, to Colossians chapter number 4. And once you find Colossians 4, hold that in your left hand and turn over and find the little book of Philemon. It's only one page long, 25 verses. Hold both of them, Colossians 4 and Philemon. And I'm going to show you a man's name. If you've got a pen, I want you to mark it in your Bible because this is is the fellow I want you to know today and think about, and you're going to meet him in heaven someday. The Holy Spirit put him in the Bible for a reason. He's repeated for a reason. You know, Colossians and Philemon are really like twin letters. They were written at the same time. They were delivered at the same time. One of them is an explanation of how wonderful Jesus is, and the other one is an illustration of how wonderful Jesus is. But in them, there is a young man mentioned. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse number 17. Right at the end, Paul says, And say to Archippus, everybody say Archippus, would you please? Archippus, tell the person next to his name, would you? What's his name? Tell the person on the other side of you, what's his name? Look back at me, what's his name? You just met a fellow, all right? Imagine your pastor standing up, reading a Holy Spirit-inspired letter, and suddenly they call you by name in it. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, wait a minute. Hold your place. We're coming right back to Colossians 4, I promise. Turn to Philemon and verse number 1 and verse number 2. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and say his name, please, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. We don't know a great deal about Archippus. Most Bible teachers believe that he was the son of Philemon. And Philemon's wife, Aphia, because the way they're grouped together here in Philemon, it's as if Paul is addressing a certain household. And the church in Colossae met in Philemon's living room. Look, you know that the Lord has his rightful place in your life when you don't just go to church, you bring the Lord's work into your home. And a lot of people believe that Archippus was the pastor of the church. And at the very least, if he was not the pastor of the church... He was a minister in the church because the Lord says he had been given some ministry. 35 years ago this month, God called me into the ministry. It was just for my 13th birthday. Look, I had no idea I was going to come to Crown College. I had no idea I was going to serve here for all those years. I had no idea the Lord was going to put us into evangelism. I had no plans. All I knew was God wanted me to serve him. I didn't know all the details. I didn't have all the answers. And by the way, neither do you. But as a 12, almost 13-year-old boy, God made me realize he wanted me in the Lord's work. I want to speak with certainty this morning. I want you to look me in the eye and listen with your heart. God wants you in the ministry. Now listen very carefully what I'm about to say to you. Years ago, in some places, there was, I think, an undue and overemphasis on the fact that if you weren't a preacher or you weren't a missionary or you weren't an evangelist, then you weren't right with God. I'm going to tell you, that is not biblical. The will of God is not what somebody chooses for you. It's not even what you want to do. The will of God is what the Lord chooses for your life. Something terrible has happened. Like a pendulum swing. We've swung in our American church culture from one end of the spectrum to the other to now 
Young people going into the Lord's work is almost never emphasized and fewer and fewer young men and young women are going into the harvest. You can't convince me that in a world where there's more lost souls than there's ever been and the time is shorter than it has ever been that God Almighty who loves all men and wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth is calling fewer young people to go into the Lord's work. I don't believe that for a minute. I think instead we have fewer and fewer people who are open to doing what God wants them to do. Somebody say, well, how can you tell us that we're supposed to be in the ministry? Are you ready for this? Because every Christian has been given at the very least the ministry of reconciliation, Paul called it. Every one of us are to be witnesses of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So whatever you end up doing for a living, that's the Lord's business. That's not between me and you. That's between you and God. But what you ought to do with your life is you ought to discover why God puts you on earth and by the grace of Almighty God start now and then fulfill it until the day you see Jesus face to face. Everybody has different family, different circumstances, lives in different places. But here's the common denominator. God wants you to serve Him with your life. How many of you really believe God wants you in the ministry? I mean by that in full-time Christian work in some way. Would you raise your hand, please? And I've heard already this week several of you have surrendered your life. I'm glad. How many of you don't necessarily know that, but you're, you're open to it and you're just praying it through right now? Would you raise your hand, please? Great. But I want you to know what I'm talking to you about right now is not just for the people who raise their hands. It's for every person that's breathing, every person I'm looking at at this moment. God has something he wants you to do in his work. So let me give you three little thoughts from Colossians. Would you look at Colossians 4 and verse 17? Here's what you got to do. The Bible says, and say to Archippus, by the way, let me just pause. Could I point out that Paul did not specifically address Archippus himself. He said to the people there, they were to encourage him. May I say to everybody in this room, it ought to be your business not only to serve God, but encourage other people who are serving God. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. Number one, would you write it down? You've got to find what God has given you to do. Notice the Bible doesn't say Paul gave it to him or his daddy gave it to him. It doesn't say Archippus chose it for himself. Look at it carefully. It says he what? He received it in the Lord. May I ask, what has God given you? You know, when you're born, you're given natural ability. Some of you are great athletes. Some of you have uh, musical gifts, which I never got. Some of you have certain talents that are unique to you maybe you've discovered them maybe you haven't maybe you think you got nothing but no you are fearfully and wonderfully made God has given you some natural ability and here's the beautiful truth on top of that when you got born again the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you and on that day you got more than natural gifts on that day you got some spiritual gift that the Holy Ghost put inside of you I don't have time to develop this but I think In the sovereign work of God and the providential purpose of the Lord, God has a way of connecting the natural abilities and the spiritual gifts so that when both are yielded to Him, we are most effective in the work He has given us to do. But I'm going to tell you this. You better find out why God left you on this planet and find the ministry God has for your life. The question is not, what has God given you? The question is, what are you doing with it? So here's the second one. Would you write it down? You've got to not only find it, You've got to follow it. If you do the will of God, it won't be on accident. It'll be on purpose. It'll have to be intentional. Look what the Bible says. Take heed. Take heed. That's serious business. The will of God is not future. The will of God is always present. Some of you think, well, I'm going to go to college. When I get to college, I'm going to do the will of God. If you don't do the will of God today, you won't do the will of God when you get to college. College students think, well, when I graduate, get to the mission field, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's nonsense. If you won't serve Him where you are, you won't serve Him somewhere else. If you won't witness to your friends now, you won't carry the gospel around the globe. You begin right where you are. The work of God is not passive. It's active. It's time to get up and get on with it. We've got too many people, weak, anemic kind of Christianity floating through life, doing nothing for the Lord. I'm saying... Find out what God has given you and then follow Him with all of your heart. And then you come to the third one. 
fulfill it. You know what that implies? It implies it can be unfulfilled. It means don't just do part of it, do all of it. Don't just start, finish. You're in Colossians, right? Look back one page at Colossians chapter, chapter 4 for just a moment and verse number 12. Maybe on the same page for you. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That, here's our prayer for you this week. You ready? You ought to make this your prayer for your life. That ye may stand perfect and complete in, would you read it with me? All the will of God. Nothing more than God wants you to do, but nothing less than God wants you to do. Don't you get one step ahead of God, but please, young people, don't lag one step behind. Fulfill all that God has given you to do. Be like Joshua when he died. The Bible says he left nothing undone of all that God had commanded. Be like Paul who could say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Be like Archippus who didn't just get going good out of the starting blocks. He pressed on as best we know all the way to the finish line. No, no. Be like Jesus who said in John 17, 4, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Wouldn't it be a great thing to finish your course with joy? See, you're young now, but you won't be young forever. You're going to be old. I'm sorry to tell you that. And you're not going to decide when you get old how you're going to finish. You're deciding that right now. 35 years ago, the night I surrendered to the Lord, an old preacher who's in heaven now, Carlos Settle, I can see that fellow. He was short and rotund, let me tell you. He met me in the lobby of the church that night, and he put his arm around me, and he said, So God's called you to preach. I said, Yes, sir. Great. Get your first sermon together. You're going to preach next week in a cottage prayer meeting. And I remember saying, Wait a minute. Let's talk about this thing for a second. I will never forget what he said to me. He said, young man, if you don't start serving God now, you probably never will. And I'm looking you in the face today to say, start right where you are and run for the Lord till you cross the finish line. Pastor Sexton and I were walking across the parking lot here one day and Many of you know because of his surgeries and spine issues, he was having problems with his mobility and, and he was struggling just to get across the parking lot and we were walking slow and talking and he stopped. And he leaned up against something and he looked at me and took a deep breath and smiled and he said, you know, Scott, he said, this is kind of like life. I said, how's that? He said, sometimes the hardest thing to do is the only thing you can do. I said, what's that? He said, just put one foot in front of another. And now I want to say to every young man and young lady here this week, just take the next step and keep taking them till you see Jesus.